Vale, y eso es lo que saben, que, que yo no lo veo aquí. Sí, lo veo. Vale, vamos a ver. Hello everyone, good morning, and welcome to this new seminar from the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía. Uh, today is our pleasure to have with us uh, Paco Nogueras, uh, Francisco Nogueras, but I will go uh, you as Paco, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Who will be talking about the galactic, uh, the, the head of our galaxy. Uh, so Paco made a PhD here at AEA under the supervision of uh, Rainer Scheller and Sean Alberti. Uh, and uh, his uh, PhD was awarded uh, in, as one of the three best uh, theses in astronomy by the Sociedad Española de Astronomía in 2019. During his PhD, he got, a, he, he got an ESO studency, and he made a nine-month stay, stay at, at ESO. And then after his PhD, he got a postdoctoral contract to work at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, in the Galactic Nuclei Group. Uh, one year later, in 2020, he got a Humboldt uh, grant, also for the Max Planck Institute in, uh, in Heidelberg. And in 2023, he got an ESO fellowship to work in the, at the ESO in Garching, uh, where he's currently uh, working. So he's uh, now an astronomer of the UT4, and he's in charge of Eris, Muse, and the Bulk Light. So today, uh, Paco will be talking about Journey to the Galactic Heart, illuminating the enigma of the nuclear star, star cluster and the nuclear stellaris. So, thank you very much for the nice introduction and um, for the opportunity to give a talk here. So it's really a pleasure. Yeah, the last talk I gave in this room was my thesis uh, defense. So it's really great to be back. And um, yeah, many things have changed, as I can see. So the auditorium is now even better than the one we had at that moment. So it's really great to be here. And um, yeah, so I'll be talking about the, the galactic center here in our galaxy. But before starting, and now that we are all awake, so I'm going to uh, advertise a bit uh, the opportunities that we have there at ESO. So this is something mandatory that we normally do, but it's my pleasure to do this. So we have two main opportunities for young astronomers. So the first thing is the ESO studentship. I have that, that studentship. And then the other one is the ESO fellowship. Once you defend your thesis, you can also go there to ESO. And now I have that thing as well. So it's really a great place to go. And yeah, if uh, you are interested, if you have students uh, who want to go, or if you are a student or a postdoc that are interested in whatever related to instrumentation, it's really a nice place. And I have also these sports cards, and I will leave them here just to yeah to give you some uh, instructions to know what to do in case you want to to join us. And yeah, it's really a pleasure <laughs> to have more people from Spain there. So now we are two fellows from Spain, and we have some students as well. So yeah, and I want to make the community bigger <laughs> because there are many people from Italy, but not too many from Spain. Um, that's a pity. And then this is just to motivate you a bit. So yeah, this is one of the things that you can see if you go to Paranal, for instance, and if you are either a student or a fellow, you will have the opportunity to go uh, here. Actually, this image, uh, this picture, I took it with my cell phone. So it's something really, it's not like a press, whatever. So it's something you can really see once you're there. And this is myself uh, in front of the ELP. So it's really a unique place. So yeah, just to, to trigger more applications. And now let's go to the talk. So I'm going to be talking about Galactic Center, as I mentioned before. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, first of all, I will give a brief introduction, motivating the topic. Uh, and then I will be basically discussing the two main stellar structures that we have in the Galactic Center. So it's basically the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster. And we will be talking about star populations, kinematics, and metallicities. And then finally, uh, I want to um, explain the relation that they, that the correlation that we have between the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster to try to understand a bit better how they talk to each other. So yeah, let's start. Uh, let's start with the introduction. So I'm talking about galactic center, but it's not only our own uh, galactic nucleus. So it's in general galactic nuclei. So they are really cool environments, and we can find almost everything there. So we have supermassive black holes, we have high stellar densities, magnetic fields, star interactions, star formation, turbulence. So it's almost everything there. So they are really unique environments. And if you have a theory in physics, whatever thing you have, you can test it here because they are extreme and you can push everything towards uh, the limit, basically. And yeah, you know, uh, supermassive black holes are also quite popular now. And we also have one in the Milky Way. So it's something uh, very interesting for astronomy. And if we go to stars, uh, which is going to be the topic of the talk, we have two main stellar structures in galactic nuclei. So we have nuclear star clusters, and we also have nuclear stellar disks. This first structure, uh, it's probably the most dense cluster that we can find in a, in a galaxy. So we have densities, yeah, many, many solar masses per uh, square parsecs. And the thing is that they are more or less well known, and many galaxies have uh, nuclear star clusters. 
And then, since uh, quite recently, we also know that there is another structure, it's nuclear stellar disk, and this structure is basically surrounding nuclear star clusters in some galaxies. But this is not really well known yet because we don't have too many um, studies on these kind of objects. So basically, the best thing we have for this is the Timeless Survey. And this survey is for uh, 21 spiral galaxies. Uh, they are similar to the Milky Way. And the thing there is that for these galaxies, uh, what they have found is that 19 out of 21 uh, they host a nuclear stellar disk. So apparently it's something also quite common. And um, yeah, it's a structure that we need to understand a bit better. When we go to galactic nuclei, uh, we are going to face a problem. And it's obvious here. So these galaxies, they are relatively close to us. So we have NGC 1291, uh, 1433, 14984, and even Andromeda. And the thing is, if we want to observe the galactic uh, nucleus of these galaxies, this is what happens. So it's something really, really tiny, as you can see here. So we are going to be uh, limited to integrated light. And that's a problem if you want to know more about stars and kinematics, metallicities, and everything, because you are not really observing star or star. It's everything together, and you're going to be dominated by the bright stars. And as I mentioned, even it's Andromeda. Here you have the comparison. This is Andromeda, and this is the, the moon. And the center of the galaxy It's something very small here. But we have also good news. We have our own galaxy, and this is why the galactic center here is really, really important. Because if we put our Milky Way center on top of the Andromeda galaxy, this is what happens, actually. The size of the galactic center is going to be almost as big as the whole galaxy. And it means that we are going to be able to really say something about the stars that we have there. So it's something unique. So galactic nuclei are far away, but we have our own template here. And we can use uh, the galactic center in the Milky Way to know more about galactic nuclei in general. Now let me introduce you the center of the Milky Way. So it's located at around 26,000 light years from us, 8 kiloparsecs, and it allows us to resolve individual stars. And even we can uh, resolve these stars uh, down to milliparsecs, case, which is something unique. So it's going to be a great laboratory in order to understand the structure and the star population at the galactic center. And the thing is that now I would like to give you some hints in order to find the galactic center if you look up tonight, actually. So I used Stellarium to simulate uh, this uh, dark sky. So this is from Granada. It's at 5 a.m., I think, more or less. If you are awake, you can try to find the galactic center. And the thing is that uh, the only thing you need to do to find the galactic center is to look for a constellation. It's called Sagittarius, but it's also known as the teapot. And it's quite obvious why, because the shape, it really looks like a teapot. And now it's even clearer, so it's a teapot. And you go to the tip of the teapot. If you follow this, this is the position of the supermassive black. So just to give you an idea, actually, the northern hemisphere is not the best place to try to observe the galactic center. You better go to the south, to Chile particularly. But still, it's something that you can do, and you can recognize this feature uh, on the sky. OK, so now let me, let me show you the main stellar structures that we have uh, at the galactic center. So this is a near-infrared image of the galactic center. This is a Spitzer view. Uh, this is the position of the supermassive black hole, more or less here. And the first thing that you notice is that we have something very bright here. And it's different from the surrounding area. The surrounding area is basically the galactic bulge, or the galactic bar, because the bulge in the Milky Way is basically a, a bar. And the thing is that we have something very, very bright here. And this is what we call the nuclear bulge. So we have many stars. It's a different uh, thing here. And it's composed of two different stellar structures. So the first one, the innermost one, it's the nuclear star cluster. Oh, surprise, so we have a nuclear star cluster here in our Milky Way as well. And it hosts something around 10 to the 7 solar masses of stars. And it has an effective radius of around 5 parsecs. So it's something really, really small and really super compact. And as I mentioned before, particularly for the Milky Way, this is the densest uh, environment and the densest, the densest stellar cluster that we have. And then surrounding this nuclear star cluster, we have something else, and it's what we call the nuclear stellar disk. So it's a platter star structure. And what we have here is something around 10 to the 9 to our mass of stars. And it has an effective radius. Well, let's talk more about scale lengths. It has, it has a scale length of around 100, 150 parsecs, and a scale height of around 40 to 50 parsecs. And it's wrong with the, the, nuclear, star, the nuclear star cluster. So this is a, a zooming uh, for the central region of the, of the galaxy. And now I want to show you how to find the nuclear star cluster in a near infrared image. So actually, this is something that I noticed when I was doing my PhD. And I'm very proud of this, because the only thing that you need to, to do to find this is to uh, look for South America. So here, you can see how the shape of the central region of the nuclear star cluster, it really resembles South America. So once more, 
And now you can see how, once you see South America in a, a galactic center picture, you know where the uh, nuclear star cluster is. And if you go to the center, you find the supermassive black hole. And then we are going to be talking about stars, but it's not only stars, but we have at the galactic center, we also have gas and dust, a lot of gas and dust. And particularly we have the, one of the densest uh, clouds of gas in the, in the galaxy, it's what we call the central molecular zone. And it has a radius of around 300 parsecs, and it's basically surrounding the whole structure that I described before, the nuclear stellar disk. So we are going to have something around 10 to the 7 for our masses of molecular gas, and it's the most prolific star forming region in the galaxy. So it's really something unique, and it's something to, to be studied, and it's really uh, correlated with the nuclear stellar disk. So that's why it's also going to be important during the talk. Okay, so now we know that the galactic center is really cool. It's a unique template to know more about galactic nuclei, but we also have some problems. So we need to face a lot of challenges in order to know more about the stars that we have there. And let's start from the beginning. So here we are, this is the Earth, let's assume, and we need to go deep inside the galaxy and we need to go through spiral arms, we need to go through gas, dust, the galactic bar, and then in the end, at some point, we will be able to reach the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster, the galactic center, but we have a lot of program things because we are inside the galaxy. So we are close to the galactic center, but then we also have this problem of being inside, and this is the galactic center because you see South America, so it's pretty clear. Here, uh, the anatomy of the Milky Way makes everything even clearer, so this is the sun, and we have one, two, three, four spiral arms, and then the bar, and finally the galactic center. So we need to get rid of this program population. We're going to have a lot of stars that don't belong to the galactic center, and then we will also have some problems related with all this gas and dust along the line of sight. Another problem that we have is that we have a lot of crowding. So we will find many, many stars in this extreme environment, and they are not only the foreground stars. So even if you reach the galactic center, once there, you will find many stars that uh, will make everything complicated because it's not easy to resolve individual stars there. So normally you need high angular resolution observations of around 0 0.2 arc seconds, more or less. And even with this, you will be limited to giant stars, which means that the brightest stars will be dominating the, the budget, basically, there. The fact that we have many stars will make also spectroscopy very expensive. So it's not really possible to go star by star getting a spectrum. So we will have maybe a sample of stars, but not too many in comparison to these 10 to the 9 solar masses that I mentioned before. And this is just to illustrate a bit this crowding. So this is a, a random region, a very small region. So this is 10 arc seconds. And even here, without any known structure, we find many, many stars. And the situation gets worse if we go to regions where we know that we have something. So this is the quintuplet cluster. So it's one of the young clusters that we have at the galactic center. And this is the Arches cluster. So even more stars. So we need to, to deal with this. And I would like to also give you an idea about the angular resolution that I'm talking about. So I mentioned uh, 0 0.2 arc seconds. So that's really impressive because it, it's equivalent to the resolution that we need to be able to observe a basketball ball from Granada to Madrid. So it's really complicated to be able to, to get this technology, but thanks to the VLT and some techniques that we have been using, it's possible to, to get this resolution and to really understand what's happening there with the stars. And we have an additional problem, and probably this is the, the most complicated one, and it's extinction. So as I mentioned before, we have a lot of gas and dust along the line of sight, and this will make our lives complicated. So this is the visible light that we get from the galactic center, and this is near infrared, and this is what happens. And it's exactly the same region. <laughs> so these are things you can identify in both, and yeah, many of them. But the thing is that we cannot do anything with visible light. And if we want to understand stars, we are going to be limited basically to the near infrared. So we don't really have too much wavelength coverage. And this will make everything complicated in the sense that if we want to know the stellar type of a given star, for instance, that's what you get. So near infrared. So it's not that easy. And here is just to show you the spectrum in different wavelengths. So the thing is, if you go to the V-band, it's basically a black ball. You don't see anything. So it's this thing here. It's just foreground population. But if you have something in the near infrared, the best you can do is to go yeah, J, H, and K, for instance. And in K, you're going to have an extinction that it's something around two to three. So this will make everything better, but still challenging. And it's not only the extinction. So it's the differential extinction. So the problem is that we are going to have variability for the extinction. Particularly in this region, what you would expect is to have something homogeneous, just stars all over the place, but we have dark patches, these ones that you see here. And they are due to the fact that we have the central molecular zone surrounding the nuclear stellar disk. 
So we have this gas and dust, and it will be different depending on the place. So it means that you also need to know how to correct this effect in order to know more about the stellar populations there. So the extinction curve is also fundamental in order to, to understand the, the galactic center. Okay, so now we know that the galactic center is really a unique template. It's complicated to observe the galactic center, but it still is close and we can resolve stars. So now let's try to know more about these two stellar components, the neutral stellar disk and the neutral star cluster. And let's start with stellar population. The first thing is to know how to get um, information there. And the main tools that we will have for this, it's CMDs, color magnitude diagrams, and luminosity function. And I want to show you how to interpret these, these things. So the first one is color magnitude diagrams. A color magnitude diagram is basically a magnitude here versus a color here. Particularly, we are in the near infrared again. So it's K band versus H minus K in this particular example. And here you have the reddening vector. And the thing is that you see many features here and you need to know how to interpret everything. So let's start from scratch and let's use some theoretical models in order to simulate star populations and to see how different variations will be affecting our color magnitude diagram. So the first thing that is gonna play a role is the distance effect. So let's assume a star population, an old one. So this is 12 giga years old. It has twice our metallicity. It's a typical metallicity for this environment. And then let's make everything simple and let's avoid extinction now. If we start with a distance of three kiloparsecs and we change the distance, this is what's gonna happen. So our star population is gonna be going down. It's gonna be going towards fainter magnitudes in K and the color will not be affected here. So we have the first effect, the first thing that will be playing a role here and it's distance. So distance will go down in the color magnitude diagram. More things, we have the extinction as we discussed before. So with the extinction, we have the reddening vector here and let's assume again our old star population twice our metallicity and now let's uh, keep the, the same distance for everything. And if we increase the extinction, this is what happens. So our star population will be following the reddening vector. So, this line here. So now we have two things. Distance will go down and extinction will be following the reddening vector. And now we have another thing, <laughs> even uh, more complicated, but quite interesting. And it's actually the star population. effect. So depending on the age of the stars that we have there, we will be seeing different features in the color magnitude diagram. So now let's repeat again the same thing. Twice our metallicity, uh, the distance of the galactic center and without extinction. And let's start with something relatively young, 50 million years old. And if we increase the age, this is what we are going to be seeing. So we will have different features and also different weights between the uh, different regions in the color magnitude diagram. So more or less stars depending on the age uh, for a given star population. And now we are ready to see again the color magnitude diagram that I showed you at the beginning and to try to interpret what we are seeing there. So the first thing that we have is foreground population. So I mentioned that we have this program population and we have gas and dust along the line of sight. And this is probably the only case uh, in which extinction is going to be good for us. Because if we are close to us, the extinction is going to be lower. And it means that if we increase the extinction, we will be closer to the galactic center. So just applying a color cut here, which is basically a proxy for extinction, we will be able to get rid of foreground stars, basically from the spiral arms and also uh, from the galaxy bar. And then once we keep the star population that we want, the one here at the galactic center, we have features. We have different features. And the most important ones, the first one we have is the asymptotic giant black pump, it's this feature here, then the red clamp thing, and then the red giant branch pump. And it's very interesting because in principle, depending on the age, as I mentioned before, we will have differences between the relative weights and also uh, about how populated these regions are. And this will give us information about the star populations. And I would like to just mention a bit more about red planet stars because they are really interesting for us and very useful because red planet stars are uh, stars that are quite stable in their lives. So it's basically the same thing as the main sequence, but instead of being burning hydrogen, uh, what we are going to be burning is helium. So it's not as stable, it's not as long lasting at all, but the thing is that the stars will be here for quite a while and the intrinsic properties are really well known. So they are going to be very useful in order to correct the extinction effect. So we can create extinction maps with them. And the idea is to use them to be ready to correct the problem with extinction for all the remaining stars. OK, that was the first thing. And it's actually the complicated one. Because with color magnitude diagrams, what we need to have is at least two bands. And the completeness, the number of stars that we are going to be detected, it's detecting. It's a bit complicated depending on uh, the wavelength that you are using there. 
we have another thing, another tool, and it's luminosity functions. Luminosity functions is basically the number of stars that we have per magnitude thing. And if we go to the most complete band, we will have many more stars and we will get more information about a particular region that we are studying. And actually, what we have is that depending on the age, we will also uh, be seeing differences in the shape of these luminosity functions. So let's start now with something very young. So this is 5 million years old. And if we increase the age, this is what we are going to be seeing. So we have differences, as you can see. And then at some point, we will see uh, all these features that I just described in the color magnitude diagram. So the main idea is that just using luminosity functions, we can know more about the star formation history and the star population that we have in a particular region. Cool. So this uh, this was an introduction of the tools. And now let's try to know more about the star population. Let's apply what we have learned for both things, for the nuclear stellar disk and also for the nuclear star cluster. So once more, we have here our Spitzer view of the galactic center. And uh, this is the nuclear stellar disk. As you can see, this is this uh, bright over density that we observe in the Spitzer view. And the thing is that let's try to understand the star for the star population that we have at different regions there, just to know what's happening there. So let's go to the central region and then to other two regions, say there should be one and say there should be. And those regions are more, uh, more towards the edge of the nuclear stellar disk. So if we were, let's start from the center. So this is the field that we studied here in a paper that uh, we published some years ago. And the thing was to use, first of all, color magnitude diagrams. And what we did was to basically apply what they had just shown you. So first of all, we got rid of the program population with this cut that you see here. And then we used red planet stars, the ones here, to create an extinction map. So this is an extinction map of the region, which is basically the extinction that we have for different uh, places uh, in this uh, region that we were covering at the galactic center. And the idea was to apply this to all the stars, depending on the position, and correct the uh, extinction effect there to be able to create a deredding for a Mercury diagram and then also a luminosity function. So this was actually the luminosity function. And once we had the luminosity function, uh, the idea was to uh, fit this luminosity function with a linear combination of theoretical models taking into account different things. So given that we are going to have differences, different shapes and relative weights for the different ages for different luminosity functions, what we did here was to apply 14 different models to uh, try to cover all the possibilities and then to minimize a chi-square to know exactly the composition that we have in, in this particular region. Um, yeah, here, this is just uh, to uh, make everything easier. Instead of all the 14 models, we combined the different models in this orange thing. These are uh, all stellar models. Then this uh, green thing, it's intermediate ages. And then the blue thing is very young stars. So that's basically it. And the results that we got, uh, it's here, uh, what we uh, what we have. So first of all, we use two different theoretical models because you can always have systematic uncertainties associated to the different models that different groups are using. And for this particular work, what we used was Bakhti models and also MIST models. And you can see how they agree pretty well within the uncertainties. So the main result is that the vast majority of the stars in this central region, uh, they are quite old. So this is not compatible, actually, with the previous paradigm of star formation at the galactic center, because it was believed for many years that the galactic center was formed in, uh, in a quasi-continuous, quasi-constant uh, star formation event. So from the very beginning, just forming stars until the current moment. So this is not compatible with what we see here, because almost everything, 80% of the stars, they are old. Then another thing that we found is that we don't have many stars here. So actually with Basti, we didn't see anything. And it means that we were like four or five million year, uh, giga years without forming stars at the galactic center. So it means that we didn't have gas there. And with this, we can also infer a bit uh, more about uh, the, the age of the supermassive black hole, for instance. Because if you want to grow something massive, you need material. And if you don't have material, you cannot form anything. So it means that basically the supermassive black hole must be quite old. And this is also related with the with the bar formation, because one of the mechanisms to, to build the nuclear stellar disk is apparently to put the gas towards the center using the galactic bar. So if you don't have gas here, it means that the bar mm, must be quite old because the gas was there before. So this is something that we could infer just using this. Then we also detected here uh, an important part of star formation, uh, which happened like one giga year ago. And we were able to also estimate uh, the, the duration of this uh, event because it left an imprint in the color magnitude diagram. So actually, I showed you before the color magnitude diagram. And here you have a zooming, and you can see two different things. So we have two red clumps. 
And this secondary clamp is due to the fact that we had an important star formation event one week ago. And if you see this, you will be seeing this effect only for like 100 million years. So it's something that happened very, very fast. You don't see this thing for over ages when you go to the red clamp. So that's why we were able to also trace to estimate more or less the, the duration of, of this. And it was really, really energetic. So many supernovae uh, happened at this point. So it was probably the most energetic star formation event in the recent history of the galaxy. And then finally, the, the last interesting thing here is that um, currently, um, particularly from 30 million years uh, till now, uh, the galactic center has been forming stars. And the uh, rate of star formation there, it's also compatible with what we observe with the Fermi bubbles. So the Fermi bubbles are two very energetic um, bubbles in, in basically high energies that we can see from the galactic center. And the supernovae that um, are due to the fact that we have this star formation event are probably enough to be sustaining these two bubbles there. So it's not really clear the origin of this because some people say that it's probably due to the supermassive black hole, burst or whatever. But apparently uh, star formation is also sufficient probably to, to be um, uh, responsible for these uh, high energetic numbers. Okay, so that was this region here, the central region. So we played exactly the same game for these two regions, CTUC1 and CTUC. In this case, we also use two different models, Parsec and MIS models, uh, as you can see here, and they are consistent within the uncertainties. And the thing is that the star formation history is different. So I mentioned before that more than 80% of the stars here at the center uh, were old, quite old, older than, let's say, 80 years. But here, actually, the situation is different because what we have is around 40% of the stellar mass uh, with that age, around 7 giga years and older than that. But we also see something important here. So we have um, like 40% of the stellar mass being due to the fact that we have stars in the edge being of two to seven giga years. So it means that we have a gradient of ages. So we have everything all here, or almost everything all. And then if you go to the edge, we are going to find younger stars. So this is very interesting because it can give us uh, some clues about this, the formation scenario of the nuclear stellar disk. And that's the next thing that I'm going to show. Well, first of all, this is just to compare everything, the, the edges that we see for the different uh, parts. So in blue is the central thing, everything old. And here you can see how for the central thing, we don't have many stars in this edge being between two to seven, but we have almost as many stars as in the first one uh, for the case of going to the edge. And to understand this thing, what we need to, to do is to, to get a picture of how the nuclear stellar disk was formed. And for that, I mentioned at the very beginning that the galactic center is really unique. It's a unique template to understand other galaxies. But now it's going to be the other way around. Given that we have also studies on other galaxies, we have some statistics and we can get to know how uh, they uh, form, how they develop the innermost structure. And that is what we, uh, what we did in order to understand our, our data. So for that, we uh, used the target survey, the one I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, this survey contains 21 galaxies, they are Milky Way-like galaxies. And what they found for all these galaxies with nuclear stellar disks, basically, is that they have gradients. So they have gradients in H, metallicities, and also alpha, alpha abundances. So now, what I mentioned before, it's just about ages, but the thing is that we are also observing a, an H gradient in the nuclear stellar disk. And the interpretation for this, it's actually what, what I briefly mentioned before, and it's that the nuclear stellar disk is going to be built from inside out. And it's going to be built just uh, by a gas that is funneled, uh, funneled towards the center via the galactic bar. So we have the bar and we have gas from the spiral arms, basically. And this gas will be going towards the center. And if we don't have anything, it will go directly to the center and we will start forming stars. And then at some point, we will have a ring of gas and dust. And this will be something like the central molecular zone that we have nowadays. And it will be growing. And then if it grows, the stellar population, the age of the stars will be different depending on the time uh, when these stars were from. So this is basically the, the whole picture of this, and it's compatible with what we observe. And it's very cool because actually uh, we can understand that the same formation mechanism that is uh, at play in external galaxies is also at play here in the Milky Way. So everything is consistent, and now we can understand why we have different ages in the nuclear stellar system. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about the nuclear star cluster. So the nuclear star cluster, it's here. So we need to go really deep inside. And Reiner actually did this work. And uh, we published a paper to apply the same technique that I described uh, with luminosity functions 
to understand the star formation history and the star population that we have in the inner region of the, of the galaxy. For this, we use NATO data, uh, particularly H and KS, uh, again, the near infrared, we are always limited to this, but with NATO, the angular resolution that we got was even a bit better than the angular resolution that we obtained with uh, the previous uh, data that we used. I didn't mention it, but it was Hawkeye data. And the angular resolution was around 0 0.2, uh, as we need to, to understand the, the cluster at least. So this is the luminosity function that we get uh, for, for this. And the technique was exactly the same thing. Uh, we applied a linear combination of vertical models with different ages, and these are the results. So we have that many stars. So, well, the red thing is all stars. Then the orange thing is the yeah, ages between five and nine, the green two to four, and then something younger for the other ones. And again, we get that many stars there, 80% of the mass, it's going to be quite old. So we have some differences because here we don't see this uh, star formation event at one get year. So it means that the star formation history was a bit different. And then we also have some contribution uh, in between two to four giga years uh, for star formation. But basically, many stars, basically the whole thing, it's going to be quite old and all stars are going to be dominating. And now, given that I talk about the formation scenario of the nuclear stellar disk, I'm going to also briefly mention the, uh, the formation scenario of the nuclear star cluster. And we have like two different channels to form the nuclear star cluster. The first one is cluster migration. It could be either globular clusters or just smaller clusters of stars. And due to dynamical friction, they will end up at the center at some point. The whole thing is rotating. We have uh, tidal forces and we have friction and they will end up there and they will be collecting more and more clusters. And in the end, we will form the nuclear star cluster. And then the other scenario is the in-situ formation. And this is just using gas, probably the same gas from the bar that I mentioned before. At some point, it will end up at the very center and uh, new stars will be born there. So those are the two channels and they both are probably playing a role because we see stars with different ages and the very young ones, we know that they were born in situ because they didn't have time to, to reach the galactic center at all. But also we have metal poor stars there and we know that they can be part of maybe a very old globular cluster or a smaller cluster. Cool. So we know now a bit about the star population that we have for both things. The summary is that they are old, basically. And now let's try to know a bit more about kinematics. So let's start with the nuclear stellar disk. And we have different sources of data. So we have a spectroscopy, but not for too many stars, as I mentioned before. So this is apogee data, actually. And the first thing that we see, if we go to radial velocities, uh, you see a dipole here. So there is something rotating. So it's pretty clear that it's also different from the surrounding area. The surrounding area is the, the bulge. If you have a look at the scales, so this is exactly the scale I showed at the beginning. So that's the nuclear stellar disk. And then all the rest is the, the bulge or the, the bulge, basically. So it's something rotating, and the rotation velocity is around 100 kilometers per second, more or less. And it's also similar to the gas that we have in the central molecular zone. And the orbital time of the whole thing, if we have a star here, it will take like five million years uh, to give up a whole rotation uh, around the, the nuclear stellar disk. What we have also done is to use proper motions. So it's not only about radial velocities, but we also have a very nice proper motion catalog using our galactic nuclear survey. And with that, we cover this central region of the nuclear stellar disk. And particularly, if we want to understand the kinematics of the, this uh, region, what you need to, to do is to go to the proper motion component parallel to the galactic plane. So it's along this axis here. This is the distribution of that component for all the stars that we have in that region. And uh, it, it is uh, best represented by three Gaussians, as you can see here. And basically, these two Gaussians are the more the, the more important ones. So the first one is stars going eastwards. And then the second one is stars going westwards. And this is traced in the rotation in the same way as I showed you before with the spectroscopic data. And then the third Gaussian is basically due to a bit of differential rotation and also uh, some contamination, the residual contamination that we have from the galactic bar. So this is the picture of the nuclear stellar disk. So it's something axisymmetric and it's rotating and the velocity is around 2.5 million seconds per year. Now the nuclear star cluster, exactly the same game. So we can start again from spectroscopy. So this was using Isaac data with the VLT. Uh, and here you can see the line of sight velocities. And you also have this dipole that I showed you before for the nuclear stellar disk, but now in a much smaller scale because this is the center of the galaxy. So once more, this thing is also rotating. And we can also play the same game and we can go to proper motions. Again, proper motions uh, parallel to the galactic plane along this axis here. And this is what we did in this, uh, in this particular field. And we uh, played exactly the same game. So we 
uh, got the distribution of the proper motion component parallel to the galactic plane, and we uh, uh, fitted uh, a three Gaussian model to uh, reproduce what we are observing. And basically, we have something going eastwards, something going westwards, and then the differential rotation that we also expect and more uh, more chaotic uh, movements that we will have towards the, the inner regions. And this is the picture of the nuclear star cluster, taking into account kinematics, and it's going to be rotating, but the velocity, as you can see, it's uh, smaller in comparison to the velocity that we got for the nuclear stellar disk. So the nuclear stellar disk was something around 2.5, and now we have something almost 2 million seconds per minute, but still rotating and uh, towards the same direction. Now, the final thing that I want to show you uh, to understand the star populations that we have there, it's the metallicities. So again, let's start with the nuclear stellar disk. So currently, this is the best survey that we have uh, regarding metallicities for the nuclear stellar disk. So we don't have many things, but yeah, we have in total like 3,000 stars. So if you compare this with 10 to the 9, it's not too many, but it's something it's the best we can do. Uh, it takes a lot of time to, to observe uh, these kind of things. And for these stars, we have lines of velocities, we have temperatures, and we also have metallicities. And here, what you see, yeah, the different fields with the number of stars per field. And then also, this is the contours uh, of a, a model of the nuclear stellar disk. The first thing that we noticed is that we are going to have a, a spread of metallicities, and this uh, matches pretty well with a bimodal distribution of metallicities. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's really bimodal, but still, we have metal rich stars, and they are dominating the metallicity budget, and we also have metal poor stars. The metal poor component is going to be something around minus 0.22 and the metal rich around plus 0.2. It's quite metal rich, actually. And now something that I'm working on now is to try to, to know how this metallicity is changing depending on the position that we have. So I have defined five different regions uh, for the nuclear stellar disk, taking into account the fields that we are covering with the, the KMOS survey. And what I have done is to check, first of all, uh, whether we have this bimodal distribution everywhere. And it seems to be the case. So we have this bimodality, and then the cool thing is that what you can do is to check how the metal rich star population and the metal poor star population are evolving. And what we find is this. So we have a gradient, and if we go towards the center, we are going to find the most metal rich stars. And the same for the metal poor component. And this is actually compatible with this formation scenario of the bar putting gas towards the center and creating the nuclear stellar disk from the side out. So we have a metallicity, a metallicity gradient for both. And now finally, let's see what happens with the nuclear star cluster. So let's go to this field. So here, actually, uh, we had a KMOS spectra of uh, around 1,000 stars, more or less. So quite a good number for the nuclear star cluster. And uh, we did the same thing. So this is the metallicity distribution there. And it's also compatible with having something by model. So we have metal rich stars, and we have metal poor stars. So the metal rich are very rich. So it's twice for our metallicity. And this is probably the most metal rich region in the, in the whole galaxy. And then we also have the metal pool component, which is a bit more metal rich than the metal pool component that we detected before for the nuclear stellar disk. And now we are ready to uh, try to compare these two structures and to see how they talk to each other. So, so far, we have seen that they are relatively different. So in principle, we have different uh, ages. They are all. The nuclear star cluster seems to be a bit older than the nuclear star and uh, the nuclear stellar disk, and we also have some differences for the intermediate ages. Kinematics, we have seen that the nuclear stellar disk is rotating faster than the nuclear star cluster, and metallicities, we have seen that the nuclear star cluster is uh, more metal rich than the nuclear stellar disk. So that's basically the summary of, of all I've been saying. But now, what's really happening there? How uh, did they form? How is the transition between the nuclear stellar disk and the, and the nuclear star cluster? So what we've been doing uh, during this talk is just to compare averaged quantities, basically going to the nuclear stellar disk and seeing what ha what's happening there, and the same for the nuclear star cluster. But if we want to understand uh, how they form and how they evolve together, what we need to do is to go uh, along the line of sight towards the nuclear star cluster and try to distinguish the different populations that we are going to find. And we will find, first of all, the nuclear stellar disk and then the nuclear star cluster. And there, we can really see the transition. So that's exactly what we did in, in this paper. And it's this region, again, uh, in this region, we have a lot of data. We have, first of all, photometry for the whole thing. It's actually the image that I'm showing here from the Galactic Nuclear Survey. So we have JH and KS uh, data for many, many stars in this region. And then we also have proper motions in this region here, except these gaps. 
So for this pre-promotion catalog, we use HST data and also Galactic Nucleus data, and we combine two different epochs. And with that, we created the, the catalog that we use for this paper. And then we also have metallicities here. We have chemos, chemos spectra for many stars in this region. And we combine everything to try to understand exactly this uh, transition uh, between the nuclear star artist and the nuclear star cluster. Let's go to the tools that we learned. So the first thing is color magnitude diagrams again. Okay. And this is the color magnitude diagram that we observe in, in this complicated region. The first thing that we noticed is that actually, well, this is the program population. And if we go following the reddening vector, here we have something and here we have something else. And we try to reconstruct the different features that we had for the red planet thing. So for the blue thing, we obtain two different features. And actually, they correspond to the features that you expect for the nuclear star disk. So you have the old stars here, and then this secondary red clamp that I mentioned before that you have given this one gigantic star formation event. But the situation is different if we go deeper inside. So if we go deeper inside, we have three different features. So this feature here, well, we simulated everything. Oh, it's going to be much easier now. So this is what I just mentioned. So this is old stars from the nuclear star disk, and this is the one gigantic star formation event. And then if you go deeper inside, what you find is the nuclear star cluster. And with the nuclear star cluster, you have, first of all, these intermediate ages that I mentioned. So it's like 15% of the mass budget. And then we have all stars here. And then the third thing here is the red giant branch bump, uh, which uh, appears once you combine the 3 gigajar thing and the 10 gigajar thing. So we have different things. But what we can show with this is that applying color cuts, you can see the different star populations from the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster. And it means that you have a correlation between extinction and distance along the line of sight. So you can go step by step and see what's happening with the stars that you have there to understand how the components are changing between the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster. So this is exactly what we did. So here we have nuclear stellar disk and nuclear star cluster. And the idea in this paper was actually to go a step further and to divide this into even smaller regions to try to uh, analyze kinematics and also metallicities uh, in the transition region and also when you are going uh, deeper along the line of sight towards the, the center of the galaxy. So this is all the stars with photometry and kinematics with proper motion that we have for this region. And these are the color cuts that we applied. So we used two bands, well, three bands, two color uh, manual tiles, JK and HK, to uh, compare and to check that everything was consistent or not, it was consistent. And the thing is that the first thing here is the nuclear stellar, uh, the nuclear stellar disk, according to this uh, feature that I showed you before in the color magnitude diagram. And then this region here must be uh, the nuclear star cluster, according to the star formation history. So let's go to kinematics, to particularly the proper motion component parallel to the galactic plane, to see how the rotation is changing. So this is what happens. These two points here, they belong to the nuclear stellar disk. They are the two first cuts that I gave. And then here, what you have is all the cuts from the nuclear star cluster. And what we are seeing, if you remember, I said before that the nuclear star disk is rotating faster than the nuclear star cluster, but in principle, they were different. But it's not what we are seeing here. So actually, there's not like a clear difference. So it's more like a smooth transition between the two components. And at some point, we have something around zero, and it's actually the real galactic center. So it's a Sagittarius A star. Everything is rotating around the supermassive black hole. And if we continue a bit, we see counter-rotating stars, and they are going towards the opposite direction because it's the, the other edge of the nuclear star cluster. But the main conclusion is that it's not something really different. So now that we are not really observing mean quantities, it's just the same thing along the same line of sight, what we see is that the transition is quite smooth. And we did exactly the same for metallicities here. And with metallicities, these two first cuts, they correspond to the nuclear stellar disk, and the other ones, they belong to the nuclear star cluster. And the thing is that we have this bimodality everywhere. It's also compatible to the mean properties that we obtained before. And what we can do and what we did here is to uh, check the gradients, to check this evolution that we see between the two different components. So if we go to the high metallicity thing, it's clear that if we go deeper inside the nuclear stellar disk and then the nuclear star cluster, the metallicity is going to be increasing. But actually, the same also happens if we go to the metal crew component. So we are going to have gradients there instead of two completely different things as we were observing before. So maybe the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster, they are not really two different components. So maybe what we wanted to, uh, to say here with this paper, we wanted to open the door to the possibility of having, of having two different structures of the same component in the end. So maybe the problem was that it's easy in other galaxies to try to study nuclear star cluster because they are super bright. 
but then many of them could also have nuclear stellar disk around, and probably the nuclear stellar disk could be the ground edge of the nuclear star cluster. And this is all related to uh, the formation scenario that I discussed before. So we have these two things. First of all, uh, the inside of formation of the nuclear stellar disk, which is also compatible with this gradient, because if you form stars at the very beginning, the whole thing will be more metal rich, and then you will be changing the metallicity, basically. basically. And the idea of this, just to make this clear, the bar will be different as well. So when you start the whole thing, you are going to be accreting gas from the central regions of the spiral arms. So you are not going too far. So the bar maybe was, I don't know, two kiloparsecs in, in length. And the thing is that the gas there is going to be more metal rich. And then uh, during the life of the Milky Way, the bar was growing. And in the end, if you have a larger bar, the gas will be coming from ledger radii, and the metallicity is going to be poorer there. So that's why you expect to see this metallicity rate. And this is compatible with what, with what we observe. And then the formation scenario that I discussed also for the star cluster is compatible with the whole thing. So first of all, we have the in-situ formation due to this gas probably panel through the bar. And then we also have the cluster migration. And the cluster migration could be responsible for this metal poor star population that we are seeing. Because in principle, if you imagine that we have something like globular clusters, they are normally metal poor. And the idea is if they go towards the center, they will get disrupted and the stars will be dispersed. And the idea is that many of these stars will also end up in the nuclear stellar disk. So that's why we also see the metal poor component there. And then we will have at some point a gradient depending on the number of stars that we have for different radii once we are at the galactic center. So the main thing is that the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster uh, have kinematic and metallicity gradients. We have a smooth transition. It's compatible with the formation mechanism that we believe that it's uh, in place now. And it's probably that we have two different components of the same structure instead of two different structures completely different. And the idea now is to go to other galaxies and to try to find nuclear stellar disk with nuclear star cluster and to understand the same relation, but yeah, with more than one point, because now we have the Milky Way and that's all. So that's something that it's in, in progress now. And I would like to conclude with the take home messages. So the Galactic Center is, is very cool. So that's uh, the main message of the, of the talk. You can do almost everything there. So I just showed a very small thing. Uh, the star population, because stars is what I like. And the star population that we have there is all, basically. We have metallicity and age gradients. The whole thing is rotating, both the nuclear stellar disk and the nuclear star cluster. And then we have gradients that show that probably the nuclear stellar disk would be the ground edge of the nuclear star cluster. And with this, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you for this very nice and very didactic uh, talk. So now the session is open for questions, both here and Zoom. So, okay. Anjan? It was a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have first a curiosity. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there was a very energetic event that happened one year ago, more or less. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you have mentioned that there is the most recent one, 30 million years, something like that, that has produced the, the Fermi bubbles. Yes, now. It's compatible with the energy that you need to maintain the whole thing. So I'm not saying that it's the reason why the Fermi bubbles are there. Yeah. But it's competitive with that. Considering that the event that happened one million a year ago was very energetic. Much more energetic. There a kind of similar structure to the Fermi bubbles that we can see still today, at some at least some tracers or something like that. That would be great, but I don't think so. I think it was too far away in time, so it's really complicated. It was more than one year ago, probably. So yeah, the whole thing is probably gone. <laughs> I would say. And the only thing that you could try to find at some point is supernova remnants, but yeah, they are probably too faint because it happened yeah, a while ago. So I'm not aware of any structure that you can really identify with this. But yeah, it would be nice. The only thing that we, yeah, that we can say that something supporting this evidence of having this one gigajar star formation event besides this star formation history is the, um, the passage of uh, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. So the closest uh, approach of this uh, dwarf galaxy happened at that time, more or less. And it was like the way of triggering gas towards the center uh, to, form in, uh, to form more stars. But yeah, about any structure like the, the Fermi bubbles, I, I think it's not really possible. And I don't really know any, anything that has been found. 
I'll read you now that this event was by the initiative with the food by Julie. Well, what, what you need to, to, to do is just basically, given the, the mass, you need to assume an initial mass function, and you can estimate then the number of uh, mass that start that you form. And then you know the, the time they are going to live, and then you estimate the number of supernovae. And it was many. I don't remember the, the number exactly, but it was a lot. Many more than the, than the ones that we expect, uh, given the recent star formation thing that we have. It's, it's something more continuous, actually. So it was not just 30 million years uh, ago. So it's something ongoing. Probably now we are like in a minimum, but still. So the, the, stellar, the star formation history there seems to be something very important. It depends on the gas availability. If you have gas at some point, for whatever reason, you're going to form stars. And if you don't have gas, you will not be forming stars. So it's, it's simple. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Paco. Um, I'm not sure if I didn't follow what you said. You said that the uh, both the mini cluster disk and mini cluster uh, rotate, but one rotates much faster, a bit faster than the other. So, is isn't there any such structure in kinematics that you can uh, try to to connect with the uh, by modality in metallicity? Well, actually, what is happening there? If you take into account both things without observing the other one. If you have the nuclear stellar disk, on average, it's rotating faster than the nuclear star cluster. And the nuclear star cluster is rotating a bit slower. But the thing is, if you go to the transition region, you don't see this difference. So it's something like a gradient. So if you go to the edge, everything is fast. Then if you go towards the center, it's going to be um, a bit um, slower, slower, slower. And in the end, you will not be rotating at the very center. So this is, you ask whether this is connected with the metallicity the bimodality. Well, with the bimodality, I'm not sure because, in principle, if you have all stars there, if they are all, they have time to to relax. So, but, but you haven't seen any kinematic difference no. between the two no. metallicity groups. Well, it it depends because if you go to to the to the center and along this line of sight, I haven't seen that. But the work that I'm doing now, I'm seeing it, but for the nuclear star artist, not for the nuclear star cluster. Because the whole situation is even a bit more complicated because I didn't mention that, but you have a lot of contamination from the bar, particularly if you study the nuclear stellar disk. So it's not along this, this line of sight, it's yeah, in, in general. And there, what I'm seeing is that you have um, a dependency uh, with two things, with kinematics, well, metallicity kinematics and uh, kinematics and orbits. And yeah, the direction of this work is pointing towards having the metal pool thing related to the bar, and the same with the orbits. So basically, for the metal rich stars, what I see is that we have two orbits, which is what you expect given the potential that you have there for the nuclear star disk. But for the metal poor star population, you have chaotic orbits and box orbits, basically, that are more likely to be tracing the bar. So the whole thing could be also related here. So maybe there is some contamination in the transition region from the bar, but the thing is that the size of the field is completely different. So it's much smaller here. So you would expect to have less contamination. But yeah, it's something quite interesting also to, to, to have a look because some stars from the bar are also there, that's for sure. But I don't know how important the contribution is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have another comment? And in, in two scenarios, you've shown to, to, I mean, to, to tell us, to, to explain how the basics are different. And so the, the crowd in the, um, the two scenarios in which we have in situ formation, that, no, that's for the migration. How do you disentangle if the, the low metallicity is, is due to cluster migration because you have low metallicity clusters migrating inwards? Or if you, you have in situ formation that coming from gas, which is transported also to the center and is, is less metallic? That's for the very recent stuff, probably, what you're referring to. And kinematics is the, is the only way, probably, to have a look at this. So, in principle, if you have a, a recent accretion event, if it's very recent, I think that you have um, the, the time, the time it's like tens of millions of years, more or less, uh, the time it takes for a given cluster to, to get disrupted there and to forget about the, the proper motions in the beginning. But if something recent happens, happened, you can trace that and you can distinguish between, yeah, if you have two young stars and one of them is moving following like a tidal mm, tail and the other one is not, you can say, okay, this is coming from a cluster and this is not. Actually, there was a paper some years ago, two years ago, I think, by a collaborator of, of us, Pelmeyer Krause, and she saw something like that uh, in the southeast of the nuclear star cluster. So there is like a region with very metal poor stars and with apparently a different kinematic. 
Well, to other galaxies, the first thing, uh, it's not that detailed, but what I would like to check is whether it's possible to have a galaxy with a nuclear stellar disk and without a nuclear star cluster. Mm -hmm. Because now what I believe is that they are related. And to grow a nuclear stellar disk, I really think that you need a nuclear star cluster. If you don't have a nuclear star cluster, you can't start from scratch. So you need an over density of stars towards the center. And the idea would be that. So actually, yeah, I'm trying to get time with, with Muse and with, with Eris uh, to an analyze uh, some nuclear stellar disks where we know that, yeah, we have hints of having nuclear star clusters. And once we have that, you can also get metallicity maps and kinematics maps. And that's uh, the way to, to go. And then it would be nice to find a counterexample, but if we don't find it, it's good for us because this might be right. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually have a curiosity. So did you try to do the star folding history also for, uh, uh, or you could, if it's good, can you do that for access and integrate? Yeah, that's something that can be done. Uh, but the thing is, uh, for that, we know that they are young. So Arches uh, is the youngest one. It's like two, three million years old. And Quintuplet is four million years old, more or less. And the thing is that we have also analyzed those fields. We haven't directly applied this luminosity function approach for that because it was not really necessary. So you have other, yeah, you have a spectroscopy for many stars there, so it's different because yeah, a spectroscopy is expensive, but if you have something cool and a young cluster is cool, so you get data. So it's, it's different. Actually, we use those fields to do the other, the other game. So just to get rid of the clusters and to uh, try to understand the star formation history using different fields and HSP data, other data sets. But that's something that, that could be done. So I, I have a student now in uh, there in Munich, and the idea is to try to reconstruct not the stellar, well, not the star formation history for Arthur Pintapel because it's something that yeah, all the stars were from at the same time, but to try to know more about metallicities. Oh. Because metallicities of young stars are tricky. Because if you want to measure the, meta the metallicity of a given spectrum, you need lines. And if you have something young, it's hot, so it's a black body, you don't have lines, and that's something that you don't know exactly how to address. And the idea is to try to use models like this, also luminosity function, to try to check once you know the edge, what can you say about metallicity? So yeah, that's the, the line of And and did you also take the chance to study the the EMF of the that's the cluster? So mm, yeah. That's yeah. that's a great question. Actually, mm, there are two things here. So the first one is I mentioned at the very beginning that we are going to be limited by bright stars. It means that in K, we go a bit below the red dot, but not too much. And this is good and bad. It's good because in our analysis, we don't really care about the initial mass function because that thing will be affecting the yeah, stars that are not there anymore because they passed away many years ago. So that's something good for us because our method is consistent and we have tried different IMFs uh, for, the, for the models, the theoretical models. But we don't care too much about that. The backside of this is that we cannot really say anything about the initial mass function with this method using that. Unless you go to a very young region and you know that there is something and then you can play a bit. But you need to, yeah, to take into account different models with different IMFs and that's complicated. But still, there, there are a lot of papers on initial mass function, particularly for Archer's moving tablet. And, and, yeah, and we, just for them, so we, like that, we know that it's top, top heavy. It's top heavy. Uh, the, the index, I think it was like 1.8, more or less, the, the one they are talking about now. Yeah, so it's, it's not as uh, the thing you would expect here in the Royal neighborhood. So it's something different and it's super interesting as well. And now with JWST, well, actually, if you can get a luminosity function and you go deep inside the luminosity function, you are able to also say something about that. And that's the next step. Okay. But for that, you need JWST. And we have some data also, so maybe at some point we can work on that. Thanks. You're welcome. More questions? Okay, if not, it's time to close the session. So let's thank you. Thank you.